Sequoia Desert here is also known as the Tree Desert uh, and supports the big small uh, cactus of Columbia cacti. And it's real bad if, if that if we get freezes uh, bad for the cardinal too, which is so hard to run to uh, because outside of freezes uh, where the skin, the green skin, and the skin is green because underneath there's the chlorophyll layer. And when this and this is this freezes with frost. And uh, and then the small still starts that that uh, uh, that tissue becomes a product, and then the uh, uh, saprophytic bacteria that invade, and uh, and then and then the small eventually begins to die because it can't produce the food. So. So in diversity, uh, we talked about the two rainfalls and no regular freezing, lots of microenvironments, nurse plants, uh, and detractors, non-native invasive plants. Uh, they study underway now here in the uh, and we're part of it. Uh, citizen science group has uh, Paul Stager uh, for the invasive work. And, uh, and then we also some water along the way. And also environmental fragmentation, and that is characterized here, uh, where where there's houses on either side, all over uh, here. This uh, reserve, uh, preserved connected by a narrow corridor here in the northern southern reserve. So. We talk about in Florida Park One the large club of cacti, and Native Americans uh, uh, had had a name for the that they translated uh, things for the barrel cactus here. The things is the samara. Uh, it doesn't have the woody ribs, of course, that the samara has, uh, and so it's just uh, tissue tissue pulling water underneath. Kirby uh, red rib spines on the Arrow cactus and gray straight uh, spines on the uh, spiral cactus. Both of them have big showy flowers, but the cacti ordinarily Talk about, yeah, the segmented cacti, the little bit longer is the segmented. Uh, prickly pear is a part of this uh, segmented uh, group as well as the prickly pear, the buckhorn, teddy bear, choya. That's one of the choy balls. Uh, this one, this one really quite a cylindrical in the segment. And uh, it has uh, uh, buds that were harvested by the Native Americans for calcium source. And the uh, chain fruit choy, that's the other jumping choy that's like the teddy bear. Uh, these um, the segments in the fruits will stick. To your clothes, just like uh, the choy bones do in the teddy bear. And here, the chain fruit kind of looks tree like. Uh, the teddy bear is sort of more shrub like. We talked about the trees, and we're, pretty soon we're going to be seeing the, the bright yellow trees. And the bright yellow ones that come out first uh, are the blue palmary. And that's the brothers. The banner petal is yellow. And here is a it has little red dots in it. Uh, but this is this is a blue palmary flower. Uh, this kind of looks like a foothill tree right here, but it's sort of pale yellow. And actually, the uh, uh, first of all, it's bright yellow because the blue palmaries are the loose flower first. And then you get foothill palmary coming in, so it looks like uh, the the palmary trees are sort of fading out, but it's actually the foothill coming in with its pale banner petal. The banner petal, banner petal here, um, the foothill is what? Not yellow, but the, uh, like the blue palmary. And then after the palmary come the ironwoods and the ironwood tree, uh, beautiful purple flowers, it's really a beautiful tree, uh, but has. Uh, sort of vicious thorns, not quite as bad as cat paw, but, uh, but the, 
but it's still a challenge to trim the, the uh, ironwood tree. And then the mesquite tree, you know, a huge important food source for Native Americans, like brown and pots. And uh, uh, it, was, it was a big edible for them. The, the flower, on the, this is pea like, uh, they're, they're all bean trees, boom trees. This is pea like flower. This is kind of a regular looking flower with petals. And this is a cat kitten. The, uh, uh, the cat claws also have cat kittens, but they're shorter than this and a little more pale. This one's yellow. And all of them have pinnate leaves as the balloons usually do in, uh, in the desert. Then balloons, especially adapted to the desert, because they bring along their own nitrogen to make protein. Now, for the large shrubs, we have, this is the last of the review here. We talked about white thorn acacia. And, and this is really a, a showy plant. Uh, red stems, yellow wall clouds, the pinnate leaves. And, uh, and here with the cat claw and with its, uh, with its cat claw like thorns uh, and shorter, pale uh, cat hands uh, as opposed to the sea tree that we just saw. So, and, uh, and it also offers a challenge to trim. So, here we go, let's pull our R2. Small shrubs, Mormon tea. And here, this is Mormon tea. It's dioecious, has male and female plants. This is the male plant. And, and actually, this is, these are quite visible each year. This is the female, it has combs. These are the flowers of the old plant. This is what you see it looking like much of the time. It might be dark, but you see my missus there. But this one is also saw a joint fur, and here you can see the joints. Uh, the Kenosha tree, which uh, is often confused or can be confused with Mormon tea, uh, has, has little dark spots along the branch. And these are scale like spots that are sort of reminiscent of the leaves and axles of some stems. So, so this one, this has uh, an ephedral like alcohol related to uh, which is a stimulant. It really doesn't contain caffeine, but, but it does have and a stimulant type tea was made from this. So. And a tree salt bush, one of the most drought tolerant, maybe the most drought tolerant shrub uh, that we have. It, 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 uh, it's, it grows more towards Yuma to uh, it, you, the creosote and the white versage are pretty much the only things that, that grow as you get toward uh, closer to Yuma uh, because of the arid conditions there. And the creosote has the yellow. It has the, the yellow flowers and deep green leaves that are kind of shiny, they're taxi uh, to prevent transpiration. And, and it has dark stems. Often the stems uh, are sort of unbranched and they're just they're long and uh, come on out to, to be trimmed. And, and then the yellow flowers uh, turn into the puffballs here, just tiny ones. The creosote has about 15 galls that are made by insects, 15 different types. This is one of them, the largest type. And this was smokable. Uh, the, the Indians crush it up and smoke it in pipes. Uh, so, and also uh, by the by the Native Americans, it was thought to be the first plant created. It was very very useful for them because it was the pharmacologic agent type agents that it contains. And one of them is the NDGA or noradiagnostic acid. If if you're a biochemist, so. Uh, so yes, this was a this was a, a very important plant, mainly as a sort of medicinal, uh, but it was also edible in as much as the tea was made. Okay, and then the turpentine bush. Uh, that if you crush it, crush the leaves. If you're having trouble telling what it is, you just take a little bit, 
uh, crush it and smell it, and it'll have a characteristic odor. And some people say it's, it kind of smells like turpentine. So this last fall, they, they kind of bloom in the fall, summer, fall. And, and they have a yellow flower to begin with this and tank. You can see it here. So th this one, it would have already was producing quite a few pods. I took this in an irrigated area. So, so it's got quite a bit of fuzzy pod here and, and really prominent here uh, next to the desert broom. And this is female desert broom, and you don't want to plant that if you want to mess. You plant the male desert brooms, and then you still get the butterflies. So here, let's see if I'll speak that. Oh, a whole the real important plant. This one produced, it was the females, produced the nuts that you see here. These are the green nuts after, after pollination. Uh, the male has this is this is uh, this is female plant, and here these after the nut ripens, it will get darker, darker brown, or it actually it will be sort of a pale brown, and then, if you, and then the nut splits open and reveals a, a dark seed, and these seeds are edible by humans, uh, but you don't can't eat too many of them. I'll see what we need to match in one more time. <laughs> and, uh, but the babies' pots can eat them and digest them. It's the only animal that can digest the uh, whole nut. But it was very important uh, because the wax, it's not really an oil, it's a wax. And it was very stable. And so it could be used as a machine oil and replaced it. Actually, whale oil. Uh, we went back when those things were used as machine movements. Uh, now they're synthetics, but uh, and it was, oh, you know, we had a commercial boom here. But the problem was uh, that it took four male plants for every female plant. So you know, in a big forest of plants, and only one out of four is going to produce the nuts. So it really wasn't a, a very good commercial thing. Uh, but it's still used for cosmetics. That wax oil uh, is in cosmetics. So the males have little berry like things uh, that you'll be able to see here. Yeah. All right. So th these are small here. <coughs> but uh, Initially, or for most of the year, it's just a little cluster of very light buds. And this is characteristic for the male. They always, pretty much always be there on the male. And, but the female will have the cakes persisting. Uh, this is where the nut is. So there, there's a green nut in there now. Uh, but after the nut ripens and splits and, and opens uh, then and falls off, uh, this palis will be left there and will still be able to identify as a whole, a whole bush. The, this shrub has vertically oriented leaves as uh, an adaptation to the desert heat and aridity. The sun, you know, hits the, hits the tip of a leaf rather than the palm and, and heat it up. So, so it's, a, it's a survival tactic. And here, these are the male flowers. So the, the female flowers are inconspicuous. But the male flowers, and I actually, even though it's a wind pollinator plant, uh, bees come every year to the to these flowers too. So so there must be a little bit of top there. There must be a little bit of uh, nectar in there that attracts the uh, pollinators. So Uh, blow valves. See, this is this is what it looked like, and this is you know nuts. Yeah, now they're they're really starting to bloom now, but yeah, it's got these big, uh, almost three feet uh, long stems, bare stems that are sticking up. Uh, but and but this is where the, the leaves will basal leaves start breeding up, and then the leaves start coming up the stems, and then you'll get flowers like this. Stem, so really beautiful shrub. 
uh, Sorai poppy that comes from the Spanish and the uh, uh, so next one, let's see, we have some other mammals. Recipes, and I have seen this. This is this is much more. Um, the one you usually see is one with all the stems, the green leaves, and all the flowers on it. But recipe is uh, that, that have, this flower occurs at the end of the stem, tall stems, rather tall stems, and and then the flower, which is pretty much the same color, really more more orange, uh, occurs at the tip end, and the mandel. Uh, if it's cup shaped uh, rather than having petals. So, I mean, it does have petals, but so they're kind of together in cup shape. Indian mallow, uh, pale, pale yellow, heart shaped leaves. Uh, they're uh, characterized by uh, compartmentalized <laughs> fruits. And, and these kind of persist, the old rivalries persist on the plant. And, so, and, and you can you can see them, they almost kind of look like a pumpkin or something. But it has compartments. And uh, oh, this, this one, a beautiful flower. There are cultures like this, this is more common. That's pale yellow, or yellow. Uh, but the uh, rock hibiscus is white. And, and see that it has that cup shaped metal type flower. Or for the Malmaceae family, and, and uh, but this white cultures will be yellow, and then Chuparosa, probably most everyone's familiar with that plant, uh, leafless most of the year, but uh, like you see here, and but the stems are pink, so you can kind of tell, and see that it's got a few flowers left here. Uh, it kind of flowers out to this, it was on the and it's a hummingbird attractant. And these are edible too. Yeah, you can you can pick them up and, and eat them, and they taste kind of sweet. And uh, I was off at the uh, Browns Ranch with my family, uh, and uh, this was a few years ago. And what's that cucumber smell? That when when these begin to to, to deteriorate. Uh, it, it smells like cucumbers, and it's really quite uh, prominent. So, so much so that, you know, what's that cucumber smell? So, first age, triangle first age. This is a common desert plant. It doesn't look like a desert unless you have first age there. Found that out by Tucson researchers and restoration projects. Uh, it didn't look like desert until they planted the first stage. And then they were good. So here, underneath it, and very important uh, understory plant, nurse plant. Uh, it's often, if you lift up the base of it, uh, you'll see mammillaria cactus. And it's in the springtime or coming towards summer, you'll see moons. On the mammillary, the mammillary attempts to bloom uh, uh, opportunistically also. So what's a nurse plant? Oh, a nurse plant, that's it, that's one that kind of protects uh, the seeds, and that's why it's nurse. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of other bursages, um, and it's called bursage if it has birds, ragweed if it doesn't have birds. Uh, but canyon ragweed is another one that we have in the preserve. Big leaves usually grows in wash in the washes because it requires more water, uh, and uh, so that's that's the canyon bursage. And then the slimweed bursage is another uh, another one of the bursages. Uh, canyon bursage is basically a, a misnomer because it has bursages. It's not uh, it's not ragweed, even though it's called ragweed. So. Yeah, wolfberry, wolfberry versus hackberry. Uh, sometimes hard to tell, and these are really delicious. The berries are, people stake out their own plants, and the flowers are beautiful, even though they're small. They kind of hang upside down, uh, inverted bell shape, and the uh, anthers stick out. And the new growth 
is uh, pale white. And this is what may be confusing with hackberry, because hackberry will look like that too. You see that in the next picture. But right angle branching, that's characteristic for wolfberry. And on the new branches and even some of the older ones, the older branches, if you look down below or down into the bush, uh, they'll be dark. They won't be quite as dark on a hackberry. So the, and hackberry inconspicuous flowers. Uh, not doesn't have the, the, the really nice looking flowers. Oh, and the, the berries on hackberry are orange. And the leaves are a little bigger. And they might even be toothed. And see how this kind of looks all disorganized. And that's because of the zigzag branching. Mm -hmm. Bigger leaves than, than wolfberry. Going back to wolfberry. There you go with the right angle branching. And here, more witchy appearance, uh, kind of all over the place, zigzag, bigger leaves, tooth. But the berries are good to eat, the seeds bigger, but you can crunch right through the seed. And Akatio, most people are familiar with this one, it looks like a bunch of dead stems with flowers on top. And the flowers are another hummingbird attracted, tubular flowers here. And it was living vets. Uh, the Native Americans and others would plant this uh, for because, because the thorns were so vicious and, and it will grow all right together. And so it's like it's living fence. And uh, the, uh, the leaves uh, will come out. It's sort of an opportunistic bloomer. And also, uh, it's important to hummingbirds of, in their migration um, because, because, because of the fact that it's opportunistic. And so it's blooming uh, when other plants may not be blooming. Uh, but the green, leaf, this, the green leaves will come out uh, within just a few days, a couple of three days after the rainfall. Uh, because this metabolism is set up that it's almost like suara, but it has an ivory metabolism, uh, but it's got the same metabolism as uh, most plants do, which is the C3, uh, rather than the specialized type that suara has. I mean, it, it, it's specialized enough that the leaves come out pretty quick, uh, not like suara, where they can shoot out leaves in, in just a uh, a few hours after a major rainfall, within 24 hours, it'll shoot out those roots to, to uh, soak up water. Uh, dogweed and odora is coming up. Might be difficult to tell the difference between these shrubs, but dogweed has yellow flower, odora is going to have white and red flower, and they smell different too. Uh, this one you can kind of add more of the smell like and it's called dog weed. And, and, the, uh, and it has kind of a brown, brown tan puff uh, after the flower is, is bloomed. And, and so, and to get that the characteristic odor that this one has, you can crush it just like you would with uh, Odora. Odora, if you crush that, then you get a different smell from dog weed. And here, the Odora flower also was different. It's more white. The dog leaves yellow, Odora white. And, but it's, it's still got a sort of a brown tint. But the, the shrubbery uh, will look kind of, they're, they're both kind of looking the same. And then brittle bush, brittle bush versus golden eye. Brittle bush is very, very common. You see that, especially around here. You see it uh, pretty much all over the place. It's a so-called missionary plant. It kind of tends to go in and after ground fires or ground has been denuded. And so then, then golden eye will uh, kind of populate the area and stabilize the soil or make it so that other plants will grow. Uh, the big deal difference between these and the the way you can tell is uh, pale, the pale, dusty like leaves here, and that's because of the small hairs on them, and deep green leaves here. This you can see further north at higher elevations, the golden. But and brittle bush grows there, plus like down here, 
So uh, they both have the same kind of flower. This one, the stems are a little more disorganized. They're not sticking up above the bush, uh, like my like, um, um, little bush. It, you know, very, here, here's the top of the bush and then the stems stick up. And so this is where the flowers are in the bush. Here you can't see it as well, but on golden eye, you don't get this kind of architecture. And fairy duster, really a beautiful plant used uh, as a decorative, of course, uh, but also occurs all over in the desert. So, anise of lagoon has seed pods, curly red ones, thin, don't persist on the plant. You can tell it's fairy duster because of that. Okay, and then the buckwheats, flat top versus ripe, uh, except for the California buckwheat, which isn't native here in this plant, but uh, landscapers at Tom Trailhead. Uh, but this one is the flat top. The flowers on the flat top on the right. So you'll see the rights next. Actually, we'll see it. this is rice. This is flat top. And, and so the in the flat top up we the flowers all occur sort of at one level on the top of the bush. On rice buckwheat, they're along the stem. The flowers are along the stem. The flowers look kind of the same, uh, but they kind of occur in different spots. And rice buckwheat is a smaller plant than uh, flat top. And it's not the same kind of buckwheat that you buy in the store. Uh, it's just called buckwheat. Oh, the other important thing. Flat top is going to be blooming pretty soon in the spring. Right, it'll bloom in the fall. So, so you can tell. So that's a big deal of difference between the two. If you if you can't tell that, well, this is a really a smaller buckwheat, and rather than a bigger buckwheat like flat top. Okay, so rights and maybe the leaves are a little bit different, but the leaves are pretty much still on buckwheats. But look at and also it blooms at a higher, a little higher elevation. Uh, you'd be more likely to see flat top down here than you would up the front. Or, or you, I said that wrong, flat top will see more, rights will see more at Brown's Range. Flat top is probably one of the places. All right, but it was, it was, it was an edible for Native Americans, but they didn't use the seeds. So, and it had pharmaceuticals in the same way as a medic or maybe throw up. Okay, so, and white rat. Uh, this is when you look, look out across the desert and you see sort of the purple gray, off color type shrubs, you know, no leaves. You can, you can. Really, just pick it out as white wrapping because that's a characteristic look. That sort of gray, pale gray, purple uh, shade that it has. The flowers are also unusual. They produce an oil instead of the nectar, and there are specialized bees that can scrape up the oil, so and, and use that. And it was it was also on the medicinal for the Native Americans. The white wrapping is a heavy parasite. It has hostoria that sink in the roots of neighboring plants. The neighboring plant is often a creosote bush. So the other ones that do that uh, are that is very the uh, the uh, mistletoe. And it has hostoria that sink into the branch of the tree. And a mesquite tree or a cat plant. And, and it produces the red berries. And they said the, the other one that does that with Hostoria is a root hemiparasite. Ratney is a root hemiparasite. Owl's clover is also a root hemiparasite. So they have little Hostoria like fungi that sink into roots of neighboring plants and take. Nutrients, water, and nutrients from the plant, but they do their own photosynthesis, so you can be justified in calling it a hemi parasite. 
and it's not a parasite that's going to, you know, fall out and kill the plant right away. Anyway. So, oops. oh, so now we're on the bottom. Uh, when does it begin? Choices. The last one we heard kind of sounded like Eastern. <laughs> okay, and the best answer is <laughs> okay. Uh, now, rainfall, yes, very important. We need some rain, and we've had proper rainfall this year. So, so if it didn't get too cold, uh, we should have a pretty spectacular one. And there are a bunch of hikes scheduled to the uh, Dallas River Reserve, and you can check website. So, um, yeah, the rain. So, we had them in the fall, and it's important in, in October. And then you have to have in the winter rains also. You don't want to let them. Let it go without any rain, you know, rain and fall, and then no rain. It's not going to be as great. So the, it had the, the seeds to germinate need that soaking rain, and uh, and then the temperatures, like I mentioned, uh, location, microclimates, uh, those are, those help. You know the the protection that the that the location, the rock shadows, mountains. Uh, the protection that happens will uh, augment the wildfire uh, season. So, uh, yeah, we don't have one every year, a great one, uh, but there, there's virtually all the symptoms see. And what is it? What is a wildfire? Uh, it's here and gone. And uh, it's, it's a native. Uh, you know, can be crowded out by non-natives. That's why you want to try to control the non-natives or invasive plants. Maybe they won't have any wildflowers, and that's happened in California. Uh, and it's and not a hybrid. Uh, it just kind of comes up by itself. It has been not cultivated. Okay, and then, oh, Mary Ann's book, uh, very useful. For, uh, she's a Long time yeah, steward, so. and the twenty dollars that it cost that it cost is donated directly to the reserve. So this is, and it's a very valuable tool, and also your uh, cell phone with a couple of apps on uh, for identification. Uh, the apps usually have the camera option that comes right up, and, and then you, and then it will give you an idea of what the plant is. Oh, and a magnified glass. Uh, that's to see the little ones. Like you'll see the little ones come up, uh, and but to see them, they're really appreciate them. Uh, you know, you can get sort of get down on your knees and use your magnifying glass. Uh, flower structure, just uh, briefly. Uh, seed balls, filament, um, and for the male guards. The female part is staying in style. That's where the food happens after pollination. Yes, okay. Flea bane, uh, it's Asteraceae, uh, so it has a characteristic uh, disc and ray structure in her. Uh, lots, of, lots of rays on the flea bane. Uh, it, can, it can also be pink. Sort of pale pink or lavender, but most of the time it's white. But if you see one, it's kind of pink or pale purple. Uh, and it looks like this, and it's still fleeting. Uh, and here we are with the little one that you might need the magnifying glass for. And as part of the forage family, that means it curved in fluorescence and it's sticky, hairy, and might be irritating uh, if you brush up against it and stuff. Uh, but but really uh, beautiful little flower, little white flower. And these have been out uh, already this year. Uh, but but you can see how tiny uh, the flower is. Orange family, a big family, with and Cryptantha, another uh, white orange 
flower. And also the popcorn flower, Arizona popcorn flower, or lipstick plant is, uh, is also has a lot of flower that um, is very close to the genus is very closely related to Tanto. And here, this is why it's called lipstick because of the red leaf edges and red vein and the leaf. Um, so, uh, and this, and hairy and sticky and curved infrared. This is curtanton here. Curved infrared. But you can see the, see the hair is going to a good advantage. Rattlesnake weed, it might have been a rattlesnake weed remedy, but probably not, but it did have some uh, medicinal uses for the Native Americans. This is a sort of a small mound, uh, and, and there'll be lots of small mounds uh, around when you see this. And the leaves uh, are, are a little bit thick and a little bit hairy, and, uh, and these are really, the flower, the flower petals are really sort of appendages, uh, not that it makes a big deal of difference, because this is, this is one of the what it would look like, a spurge. And that means if you break it, uh, it has a milky sap that kind of bleeds out. And uh, desert tobacco, uh, it kind of looks like a detour flower, but a small, much smaller version. It's hairy and sticky. Uh, it, did, uh, it does have nicotine and was smokable uh, Native Americans. Uh, but uh, you have to be careful here, uh, and especially with the day two, too. Um, the Native Americans knew how to use these things, but uh, other people have died trying to use them. So be careful with the food drop. And they tour a beautiful flower, it tends to occur in areas that have been wet, uh, bigger than the uh, tobacco flower, big leaves. Big flower, thorny fruit, that's, that's the thorn apple name, uh, and, and the medicinal. Um, so, it, the scopolamine is the main ingredient here. Um, and uh, yeah, when the, it is said that when the young man wanted a vision, the shaman went to nature. That's the scopolamine. So, uh, low dose. It can be used here. Uh, high dose, high dose uh, you may get in trouble. But the uh, Native Americans knew uh, well how to use this. Also called gypsum weed. And, uh, and there's a big moth, a big caterpillar, which has a big caterpillar that pollinates this plant. That's so also kind of drop time. Prickly kind of looks like a thistle, but it has a flower unlike the thistle. The big kind of cowboy fried egg, you can see it. it's a big flower and rather big plant that kind of looks like a thistle. Um, let's on to the daisies, and there are several daisies here when we get to a comparison slide. This is the one that you see commonly. And the so-called black blackfoot daisy, and underneath the petals in the area of the grass, uh, it, it may turn black after it's been around a while, and then sort of down at the base of will. So that's that's how it gets its name. That there are structures underneath that kind of look like a black foot, I guess. Uh, so that's blackfoot daisy. And so here are some more daisies that you may very well see. And here's the black flower. And the white woolly daisy, that's going to be easy to identify. And then you'll see it's a, small, it's a smaller plant. But this kind of grows as a rounded shrub. This one here is going to be a little flower, uh, kind of on the desert floor. Uh, but it's going to have a woolly, woolly plants underneath, fuzzy. And you'll be able to you'll be able to pick that out right away. So, uh, so the woolly daisy is not going to be a problem to identify. The rock daisy has smaller petals than black fruit. So, and and it does sort of tend to occur along rocky walls. I've seen it along rocky walls and water 
we want to join. So, but for it. And then, uh, this one's a little more unusual. White daisy tiny tips and tiny tips because each of these petals, this is a one petal, has three distinct tips. So, so that's the white daisy. Look at all these are white daisies, but that's how you kind of, those are the distinctive things about them. And wishbone bush, you see a lot of this. It's got thick, sort of fuzzy leaves, and then and then a, uh, a really beautiful flower, and it produces lots of flowers. Bush and and stamens that stick out. Uh, there'll be a pink splash uh, in the in the center, and, and really prominent stamens here. And, oh, and I was out on Bell Pass Trail. And this hiker comes down. I just saw a big, beautiful white flower up there. Right there. What is it? Yeah, so, and so when I went up to look at it, it was chicken. And this is the Mexican or desert chicken. Um, and it's the big, bigger flower. Also, California chicken occurs here. It's a smaller flower, but this is likely the one that you're going to be seeing. Uh, and it has a Beautiful stripes uh, right by the these are the brass here. And uh, so again, yeah, what, what a beautiful flower. So uh, we'll, we'll probably see some of these this year. Uh, California primrose or the sun cup, four petals, primrose family. Uh, it's kind of a long stem and it does have uh, uh, thready leaves on it. You can see the leaves all oh, down here. So the leaves are kind of uh, almost sort of pinning more for the ragged or regular four petal sun cup. There's a smaller variety that happens to a miniature sun cup, and it looks kind of like that, but it's just smaller. Uh, desert variable. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen this. Uh, and it's got you know, pale, fuzzy leaves and stems and big yellow flower. And it may bloom opportunistic. It'll bloom here in the spring, uh, but, but opportunistically as well. So, oh, and it, it, is, uh, it is poisonous uh, to some animals, but some reed animals, but not others. And on to the poppies. So there's a poppy that happens here uh, in the springtime, blooms in the spring, and one that blooms in the summer after the monsoon rains. And one in the that blooms in the summer is the Arizona poppy after the monsoon rains. Um, and the one in the spring is the Mexican gold poppy or Mexican poppy. Uh, but, and it did have the Mexican poppy that blooms in the spring, uh, had medicinal use. But, um, but, it, but it's not the same thing as opium poppy. So they're, they're way different, different families. So this one, this one, um, but, and this one, I don't know that it has any use, this one. It's, So Arizona poppy has a red in the center and occurs in the, in the summer after the rains and the Mexican gold, smaller plant. This one has pinnate leaves and uh, this one, the leaves are a little more red, deeply low. Senna, uh, another maroon with pots. Green pods, split open pod, seeds come out after it splits all the matures. Uh, and here we have coming up along with the Senate is the fringe hammer. And that was really uh, quite prominent after the monsoon rains, I think this last year. Uh, it had it all over the place and it kind of looks uh, it kind of looks like a bit of that with the curved inflorescence. Uh, but 
and, but it has these uh, these leaves here, and they're not especially sticky. But first of all, it's white, and then it turns red. And, and if you were out on the trails, I boy, you really see it uh, quite readily. The senna has a yellow flower. And like I said, it pods, it produces after pollination. Ear vetch, um, distinctive because of the, the yellow red flowers on a bush, and it has thin, curly red seed pods that hang in the plant uh, after the flowers go, and sometimes even after the leaves go. So, I am here is the filament, another one of the borage. Borage puts out lots of flowers. Uh, and this is the fiddle neck up here. Here is the fiddle neck because it's got the curved inflorescence and sticky wings. And this will grow fairly tall. I think I'm up to three feet. In it. And sometimes, you know, when it's real close to the trail, it can be very irritating on your skin when you brush up against it. So we had to chop a bunch of them down for one of the years that, that it was especially prolific. So, so it does have toxins in it, um, but, uh, but it's attractive to the queen butterflies uh, for, for their reproduction. And, uh, but, but even though it's toxic, the birds eat the seed. And this one, an invasive, and you may have seen it, 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 it is really, really prolific. Um, it, it, uh, it was introduced, and um, the yellow ball flowers, and they're, some people say they're attractive flowers, they probably are um, carotid leaves um, that, that have flowers uh, turning to a seed head, seed head, um, and the seeds readily spread. Um, it grows as sort of a man or uh, up to a foot tall and uh, it crowds out the other native plants and uh, very good at competing. Uh, may have three generations of plants but in, a, in a good wet year. And so this would be a year uh, that we're probably going to see the uh, state net or it, it also is called low count eel. Yeah, I mean, it has lots of, lots of flowers, lots of seeds, you know, very good competitive. And now we have spiny gold weed versus threatening ragwood. And, the, and here we are with it, yeah, with the thread, hit the wrong button, it's threatening ragwood here. Uh, and the petals are sort of droopy and scrub part, and the leaves are threading, on the thread leaves. And here, the leaves are sort of more ragged here. Spiny, that's the spiny part here. And it has little spikes on it. And the, and the petals on the flower are crowded. And on the thread leaf, uh, they're spread apart. And droopy, and here they're kind of uh, they're kind of stopped and crowded. And there's also a difference underneath where the supporting bracts are, the supporting structures. But on the thread leaf is more linear. Uh, here they're more, but you're probably not. But easy to tell. Easier to tell the difference, probably. I mean, sometimes you can really sort of get confused. Uh, the uh, the petals here are different. Oh, it has the the thread leaf has the same uh, potential for production of pheromone and by the butterflies. It has the same role as the alkaloid. Okay, so on the comparison thread leaf. And spiny gold with crowded petals, droopy with spread apart petals, to the thread leaves, the threaded leaves, and the spiking leaves. Uh, this, this, we may very well see this this year. Uh, it tends to carpet desert. 
here's a gilead up, up here. I can't tell whether it's uh, whether it's a white gilead or a star. I'm really the union is a little bit too far away. And uh, but but it's a small yellow flower. There. It kind of looks like it. and this one. If you want to dress up your cat claw with a varicose lily here, you know, big thorns. Uh, not big, they're small thorns, but they tend to be curved and pinnate leaves. And so so these are these will make it bleed very easily, but very beautiful maricosa lily. These these have three petals. They're overlapped here, so it's hard to tell that there's three. But and this comes from a berry corn, or which is like a bulb. And so, and so we should see, even if it froze, you know, and because it tends to sort of occur at higher elevations, but even if it froze, the corn is buried, and so maybe it survived. And that will get some miracle stability. They have long curvy leaves uh, sometimes. They're the picture of Marianne's book. Big long curvy weed. And uh, and so yeah, very beautiful flowers. Uh, generally occurs high enough, but the berry that has a berry corn, but it takes soaking rains to, to get it to journey. So you have to have the proper rains, which we have this year. Uh, now the, the purple orange, the white orange for Tampa, the yellow orange for the purple orange for and it has prominent anthers, a prominent anther stage, purple flower. And it's also irritating, like a lot of the oranges. Fiesta, the anthers don't stick out, they're black. The flowers are probably very small. Yeah, it's part of the orange thing, and the anthers hair has distinctive woven grass. No, this the, the leaves are also uh, full of stone. That they, they, they were they were all over the place. Uh, you can see them uh, before before the flowers came out. I'm not sure it's seen. But this right here is the, these are the characteristic grass. So if you if you see this. This kind of distinctive grass on um, flower, pale purple flower with dark stains, uh, that you're best bet is to guess if you're having trouble telling the purple flowers. Uh, the Coulter's movement, there's also a Mahada movement, this one's Coulter's, and um, it has palmate leaves. And these, these red areas here, these are white, white or pale yellow. The turn red after pollination, so the pollinators then know to pass the flower by if they see the red. Mm -hmm. So, and lupin, you know, this is one that uh, is pictured with poppies and um, sort of wildflower pictures. pictures. Mm -hmm. And here we have a Bahada lupin, and it's uh, sort of, it, it's a different color of purple, my deep purple and uh, closer to the and pale purple and the sun of the and very hairy leaves that are a little bit thicker. Still, sort of palmy, lovely deep, and chia. The thing here is not to confuse the basal rosette with Sahara mustard. I once you see the flower and stock, uh, you're not going to confuse it. But if you just see the leaves, it, it, these are bumpy, sort of, um, bumpy, low leaves, like, uh, and you might uh, think of Sahara mustard, which is an invasive with a tall yellow flower. Uh, but but it's, uh, this, this is chia, and the bumps are more um, spectacular here in chia. And, and this was, this was really, so very, the seeds are very nutritious and uh, used to be uh, mixed with water and taken on long haul hikes and would, would provide energy for the whole day. So, and it's very nutritious seed uh, used extensively by Native Americans. 
also a medicinal and desert hive, hyacinth, or so called lunga. And it's got a long, long stem and a cluster of purple flowers at the, at the end of the stem. Uh, and it comes also from a deeply buried, a buried corn. Uh, and that corn is edible and unequal. Uh, here we go with owls clover. The other ones you'll always see the wildfire actors who bring the owls clover poppies. Uh, and here we have a genetic variation. Uh, they're usually pink like this. Uh, this one is another one that's a hanging parasite that has a story that would uh, sink into roots of neighboring plants. So this one usually occurs uh, that it sinks into it and gets the water and nutrients to the parasite. Uh, does its own photosynthesis. It does have uh, some greenish there. And fillery, another purple uh, that could be confused with gillia, et cetera, and other purple flowers. This was an invasive back in the 1700s, probably brought by Spanish explorers. Uh, and it, it was, it's a, a Good and aggressive competitor, Rose is kind of a mat and does crowd out for the filters. So, but it has a little purple front. And yeah, from the Mediterranean. Gilead, so you know, see, but this one has the characteristic leaves. Gilead is sometimes hard to see the leaves, especially if it's a color like this. But the leaves are a bit different. And in Gilea, this is yellow throat Gilea. It has a, a yellow center there and blue mantles. And so the Villaray doesn't have those structures. No, no yellow throat, no blue mantles. And it has these characteristic leaves. The <coughs> carrot. So it's carrot. <coughs> There is um, a white gilead, the star gets a little smaller than the flower, but it has white petals. Okay, so yellow through, both of them have yellow through the leaves. Okay, here's a comparison. This is a new one, woolly star, but like the woolly daisy, there's a woolly underneath. So you'll always be able to tell that, even though the flower kind of looks sort of the same as some of these others, especially Gilead. And Gilead and the Holy Star were uh, quite prominent this past spring, you know, about a year ago. Uh, there were, uh, and I forget which one came first, uh, they both kind of bloomed in the spring, but uh, there were. Tons of these that seem like Magnolia, and I think the, the Woolly Star made very well at first. So there's a bunch of these, okay, and, then, and then they uh, uh, sort of went away, and then uh, Magnolia came up. So, so they were they were they can be quite prolific. Fiesta flower, a really large, uh, but it has the dark anthers. Yeah, and it's kind of a droopy, it's sort of upside down flower. And the facelia was a prime to tell the difference between these two. The anthem is really prime. And then uh, the filler. Mexico thistle, powder puff, purple. Uh, don't pull it up if you see it as a native. And it has uh, value. Uh, to the Native Americans and also to the Native Nazis. Uh, it is for sure thistle, but, but really attractive purple flower. It turns into a seed head. And then south thistle, it's attractive to pigs. It doesn't, it's not like a real thistle with big thorns and stuff. And it has a dandelion like flower and the white seed pot. Yeah. But the leaves and the leaves are edible sadness right at the beginning. So when you're young. Mm -hmm. And 
export it because it's thank you for coming. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>